This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Water Clock Welcome to the final part of our three-part look at the history of seafaring and navigation. If you haven't listened to the previous episodes about the Carrick and about Dead Reckoning, you're probably going to be a little confused. So go listen to them. We'll wait. Ready? Good. When we ended Dead Reckoning, sailors were still navigating by the same technique they had used for hundreds of years. They pointed the ship in the right direction, made a rough estimation of the speed and distance traveled, crossed their fingers, and hoped to arrive at their destination. It only really worked if you knew exactly where you wanted to go, and if you kept very, very precise logs of every moment of your voyage. Early explorers got by on it, but only just. Around the same time, folks started to wonder if there wasn't a better way to navigate. See, they noticed something. Because the Earth is a sphere, and because the stars, the moon, and the sun all follow regular courses across the sky from east to west, they thought it should be possible to figure out where, exactly, you are on the Earth by measuring the positions of the stuff in the sky. And sure enough, they were right. Using tools like the cross staff, astrolabe, and sextant, you can measure the height of various celestial objects over the southern or northern horizon and determine how far north and south of the equator you are. And that's where we're going to pick up the story, because those new advancements in celestial navigation only solved half the problem. See, the Earth is a sphere, but it is also, in a sense, a flat surface. It's just that the surface curves in on itself and meets itself around the other way. As long as you aren't flying in the sky or burrowing underground, and sailing ships don't do either of those things, as long as you stick to the surface, you're dealing with a two-dimensional plane. Even though the Earth is a three-dimensional sphere, the surface of the Earth only has two dimensions. Now, if you're a fan of science fiction, you're probably familiar with the concept of dimensions as alternate universes you can visit. But scientifically speaking, that's not even a little tiny bit correct. A dimension is something that can be measured. A length, for instance. And when it comes to positions and distances, dimensions can be very powerful if we're willing to put them at right angles to each other. For example, Imagine you have a piece of paper and you put a dot somewhere on the piece of paper. You can tell me where that dot is by telling me it's five inches from the lower left corner. But that doesn't tell me much. After all, it could be five inches away in any direction. Five inches along the bottom of the paper, five inches along the side of the paper, five inches toward the middle of the paper, somewhere between any of those three. Now you could come up with a way of giving me the exact direction, say, toward the stapler. That is basically what Dead Reckoning does. But there's another way to tell me. You could say, for example, that I need to go three inches along the bottom of the paper and then four inches up from there. That's why we say a piece of paper is a two-dimensional surface, because any distance or position on that surface can be described with two measurements. In this case, over to the right and then up from the bottom. Heck, you don't even need to start from the corner. You can start from the middle of the paper and give a location as a distance left or right and a distance up or down. It's all the same. And if you're working on the surface of the Earth, you can express distances in terms of north or south and distances east or west. Why is that so powerful? Well, it's powerful because assuming you're working with a flat surface, it's very easy to figure out the distance and direction between any two points on the surface. You just need to know something called trigonometry. The story of trigonometry begins with the birth of an idea called an angle. And that idea dates back to 300 BCE and Babylonian astronomers. The Babylonians were very concerned with figuring out how to map out the stars. They wanted to understand the passage of time and read omens in the sky, that sort of thing. Now, 
They worked out they could track the path of the sun through the sky. It followed a circular path through the circular sky. Because their counting system was based on multiples of 12, they divided the path into 60 segments. 60 was a very important number to them, being 12 times 5. It was like our 100. When the sun first rose, it was at zero. Halfway through its trip, it was at 30. When it set, it was at 60. But what they were really measuring was angles. A line drawn from the sun to your eye, and then from your eye to the point of the sunrise would make a particular angle. That angle told you how far along the sun's circular path it had gotten. So even though we think of angles as things measured between two straight lines, an angle is actually a measurement of distance along a circle. And because of the Babylonian obsession with the number 60, to this day, the passage of time and the measurement around a circle is based on the number 60 and the number 360, which is 60 times 6. That's why there's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour, which will be important to remember. Anyway, the Babylonians devised ways of measuring angles between lines and distances along circles. And when the Greeks came along, this got them really excited. See, the Greeks loved circles. They were perfect shapes. But measuring circles was a pain in the protractor because the distance around a circle was hard to calculate exactly. Partly it's because curved lines are hard to measure, and partly it's because the distance around a circle is always some crazy number that includes an impossible to calculate fraction. See our episode about pi for more details. The Greeks hated crazy fractions. They liked nice, perfect whole numbers. And the Babylonian circle math divided circles into nice whole number segments. In around 150 BCE, a Greek astronomer known as Hipparchus of Nicaea used the Babylonian math to measure the positions of 850 stars in the sky. But then, according to some ancient scholars, Hipparchus started playing around with the circle math and wrote a 12-book series about the math itself. Unfortunately, those books have never been discovered. But two other scholars did build on his work. First, there was Menelaus. He published a book called Spherica in 100 CE. Then came Ptolemy, who published his Mathematics and Taxis, or Rules of Math, in around 130 CE. What these Greek mathematicians discovered was that there was some very exact relationships between the lengths of lines and the distances along the circles they were drawn inside. In other words, there were very precise rules about how long lines could be if they came together at certain angles. The practical upshot was this. If you had a triangle, which is just an angle between two lines that's been closed off with a third line, and you could measure two things about that triangle, you could figure out any other measurement. For example, if you could measure the length of just two sides of the triangle, you could use some math to calculate the length of the third side or to calculate all of the angles inside the triangle. And if one of the angles was a right angle, a 90 degree angle, the math was extremely easy. All you needed was a list of very precise numbers for every possible angle, because those numbers never changed regardless of the sizes of the triangles involved. Those numbers were named the sine, the cosine, and the tangent. Ptolemy spent years calculating the sines, cosines, and tangents for many, many, many possible angles. And he published them as part of his great work, Mathematics and Taxis. Thus, the math of trigonometry was born. And now you should be able to understand why measuring your precise position on the Earth would be extremely useful. There already existed mathematical tools that told you how to figure out the precise distances and directions between any two points on the flat surface of a sphere. Back we go again to the story of math. By 1500 CE, latitude, the north and south location of the Earth's surface, was easy enough to measure. 
you just needed to measure the height of a particular star or the sun at noon. Compare it to the known height of a particular star or the sun at noon at a known location. Do a little math. And you knew exactly how far north or south you were. Neat. But there was a problem. Because you need two measurements to define a location, right? You need an east and west location. And that wasn't so easy. See the sun and the moon and all of the stars. They travel across the sky every day from east to west. That's because the earth is spinning under them from west to east. You can measure the height of the sun, sure, or the moon, or the stars but you can't be sure what that measurement means. For example, if you measure the sun and find that it's overhead, and then sometime later you find it is halfway to the western horizon, that could mean that three hours have gone by, or it could mean you traveled some distance to the east and no time has passed at all, or, and certainly more likely than a magic teleporting ship, both. The sun's position and the moon and the stars and so on, change depending on both the passage of time and your east-west movement. The Babylonians didn't care. Their cities didn't move, so they could easily map out the sky. But ships do move. And that brings us around to the missing piece of the navigational puzzle. In order to truly, accurately measure your position to the east or west on the Earth, you need to account for the precise passage of time and time is complicated. In some ways, time is very easy to measure. You can count days or weeks or months, you can follow the seasons, you can tell day from night. And if all you have to do is farm, for example, that's plenty of information. For the average human being throughout most of history, you didn't need more information than you could determine by counting the days or checking whether it was light or dark outside. Now, as far back as 1300 BCE, other methods for measuring smaller units of time existed. The Egyptians noticed that as the sun crossed the sky, shadows on the ground moved. The earliest known design for a shadow clock or sundial comes from the tomb of the pharaoh Seti I. It was basically just a cross-shaped gnomon. That's what the vertical stick that casts a shadow on a sundial is called. And some markings cut into the ground. Sundials were used by Egyptian priests so they could conduct specific rituals at specific times of day, which was important to their faith. But sundials have some weaknesses. First of all, for obvious reasons, sundials do not work at night. Second, the relative movements of the earth and the sun change throughout the year. That's why we have seasons. So shadow clocks varied in accuracy from season to season. The Egyptians developed another tool for timekeeping, and this is something that every fan of Dungeons and Dragons before 2008 has probably at least heard about. Because, inexplicably, in the first, second, and third edition of the Dungeons and Dragons Player Handbook, you could buy a water clock. If you wanted to waste tens of thousands of gold pieces on something too bulky and delicate to move, that is. What is a water clock? Well, it's a clock that marks the passage of time using water. The earliest water clocks were invented by Egyptians. The Greeks who adopted them from the Egyptians called them clepsydra, which means water stealer. And they consisted of little more than two bowls or jars nested together or hung over each other. Water leaks from one vessel to the other by means of a small hole. And the water leaks at a very precise rate. As the water leaks out, it exposes marks on the inside of the bowl, showing when an hour has passed. The Egyptians used them to ensure their rituals were conducted at the proper times, day or night. The Greeks and Romans used them to time political speeches or testimonies during legal proceedings. But water clocks had their flaws too. Obviously, they weren't exactly portable, but they also tended to slow down as the water ran out. That's because the water pressure would decrease the Greeks compensated by building large, elaborate timepieces like the Tower of the Winds. Constructed by Andronicus in Athens in the first century BCE, the octagonal 40-foot marble structure was primarily just a huge water reservoir for a water clock. 
The tower, known as a horologium, or building of the hours, included a weather vane, compass points, sundials on each of its southerly faces, and the water clock to mark the time when the sun wasn't shining. But the D&D water clock was neither a pair of bowls, nor was it a 40-foot marble tower. See, water clocks kept getting more elaborate, complex, and accurate as the time went on. And they remained the height of timekeeping technology for centuries. In Roman Greece, water clocks became status symbols. In Persia and China, water clocks were also symbols of wealth, but they also served spiritual or philosophical purposes. With the advent of Christianity and Islam, priests became increasingly concerned in Europe and the Middle East with accurately timing rituals and prayers. The water clock was the only solution. Eventually, the marks in bowls were replaced by weights, floats, turning dials, and gears, all of which could be driven by running water or other fluids. And the technology continued to improve, as did the artistry. Chinese inventors developed mercury clocks that were more precise and accurate than water clocks, and could track time in seconds rather than minutes. Persian water clocks started to incorporate bells, moving dolls, and even mechanical birds. In the 12th century, the Muslim inventor al Jazari built the famous scribe clock. It was small enough to fit on a desk, and involved a rotating figure whose pen pointed at the current hour. Meanwhile in Europe, bulky water clocks were developed with faces and dials. And those are the sorts of water clocks an adventurer in D&D might expect to waste their money on. Water clocks became quite accurate over the years. Some Islamic water clocks were known to run for a century before they required any adjustment. But they just weren't suitable for use on ships. The problem was, that they had to remain still. You couldn't jostle them. You just didn't want to rely on a clock you could accidentally spill on an ocean voyage. Marine sand glasses, as we mentioned last time, were only a partial solution. They weren't very accurate for anything other than very short periods of time. And then, as early as 1309 CE, in Italy, according to some records, someone made a major breakthrough someone invented the escapement mechanism. The escapement is pretty much the most important thing in the history of accurate clocks. Which is funny, because it's actually a pretty simple idea. An escapement is just a little thing, a catch or a chalk or a tooth or whatever, that stops a wheel from turning at regular intervals. So imagine you have a big drum and you wind a rope tied to a weight around it. Let it go, and the rope will unwind rapidly as the weight falls, spinning the drum. But now, imagine there's a catch that stops the drum from turning. Then it lets it turn. Then it stops it. Over and over and over. Turn. Tick. Turn. Tuck. Clock. The oldest known working clock in the world comes from the Salisbury Cathedral in Italy. It used a big metal bar that would wobble back and forth, locking a spinning drum into place and releasing it again. Weights on the other end of the bar could be moved around to adjust the rate of its wobble. That mechanism was called the verge and foliot. There was no clock face. The mechanism would just ring chimes every hour, which gave the device its name. From the Latin... Cloca, meaning bell. And with that, the era of the water clock ended, and the era of the mechanical clock began. Early mechanical clocks were huge and heavy, and we mean huge. They were tower clocks. They relied on huge weights to provide the driving force, and the escapement mechanisms and the gears that would rotate hands at various rates to mark out minutes and hours were also quite large. But in the mid-1400s, someone discovered that if you took a metal strip and coiled it really tightly, it would gradually unwind itself. If you attach that to an axle, the spring 
would turn the axle. Thus, the giant weights that powered the clock could be replaced with a mainspring. The oldest of these weightless clocks came from Burgundy in Germany, and although a clockmaker from Nuremberg, Peter Henlein, is generally credited with inventing the mainspring clock, records indicate others developed similar clocks before him. In the 15th and 16th century, in metalworking towns across France and Germany, inventors experimented with different escapement mechanisms. Combining smaller escapements with mainsprings, they could make smaller clocks. Clocks that could sit on your desk, for example. But the escapement mechanisms were imprecise. Most clocks of the time didn't even feature minute hands. The problem was, wobbling weights and other weird inventions didn't keep time accurately enough. But then, a brilliant Italian polymath, who we have discussed before, noticed something important. According to legend, Galileo was sitting in a cathedral in Pisa between lessons at university when he noticed a lamp hanging from the ceiling and swinging back and forth. He noticed that it always took the same amount of time between swings. When he later started studying gravity and discovered that gravity pulls equally on all objects regardless of their weight, he realized that all pendulums should swing at the same speed, regardless of their weight. With a little bit of experimentation, he discovered that the rate at which any pendulum, any weight suspended on the end of a rope or flexible arm, the rate at which any pendulum would swing was a mathematical function of its length and nothing else. And he was able to devise a mathematical formula to describe the exact rate of the swing. Using Galileo's work, Dutch scientist Christian Huygens built the first pendulum clock, and it was leaps and bounds more accurate than any clock that had ever come before. But, while the pendulum increased the accuracy of modern clocks, it was a step backwards in terms of size and portability. It made possible long case clocks like the grandfather clock and wall mounted clocks like the German cuckoo clock. But you couldn't bring a pendulum clock on a ship. They were big, bulky, and they had to remain still and stable. Jostling them would cause them to lose time too. Huygens and his partner, Robert Hooke, continued to experiment with various methods of keeping time. And eventually they discovered that a coiled spring, similar to the main spring invented earlier, would work just like a pendulum if you gave it a little nudge. That is, if you gave it a little poke, the spring would alternate between tightening and loosening itself. Attach that to an escapement, put that in a clock driven by a main spring, and you had a fairly accurate clock that you could make pretty small. Using these mechanisms in 1675, English clockmaker Thomas Tompion invented the first pocket watch. A pocket watch can certainly fit on a ship, right? And you can't spill it or jostle its pendulum, right? So we're done, right? A ship's captain could carry a pocket watch to account for the passage of time on a ship, right? He could carry the watch and know when it was supposed to be noon every day. And then he could measure the actual height of the sun from east to west. With some math, he could determine how far he had traveled east or west of wherever it was noon. Right? Well, not quite. The problem was the hairspring. That's what that little vibrating spring was called. The hairspring was not accurate enough. It would lose a little bit of time each day. More than ten seconds a day. Traveling from Europe to, say, North America... A difference of 10 seconds when measuring the position of the sun can result in a difference of almost 1,000 feet on the surface of the earth. After five days, you're off a mile. On a voyage that could take two or three months, that could mean being 60 to 90 miles off course. And if that was the middle of the ocean, you missed your target. Meanwhile, Trade between Europe and the Americas had become a thriving business. Especially for England, 
who had established a whole bunch of mercantile colonies on the eastern coast of North America. The British government became desperate for an accurate clock to fix the longitude problem, the problem of measuring the east or west position of a ship, once and for all. In 1714, they passed the Longitude Act. It guaranteed a prize of 20,000 pounds to the clockmaker who could produce a chronograph, a clock, of sufficient accuracy for use in navigation. For 20 years, no one could do it. And then, in 1735, a man named John Harrison came out of nowhere. He was a self-educated carpenter and tinker, a dabbler. He presented his prototype chronometer. It relied on a balance spring, of course, but it also used bearings, extremely accurate gears, and other mechanical improvements. It was tested in 1736 by the Parliament-appointed Commissioners of Longitude, who said it was promising, but not good enough. Harrison continued to improve his invention. In the end, he developed five clocks of increasing accuracy. Each was deemed not good enough, despite being the most accurate clocks the world had ever seen. The last of his five prototypes was so accurate that Captain Cook was able to sail around the entire world in 1776 and keep his position to within an accuracy of eight miles. Harrison's designs were passed along to professional clockmakers, but the commissioners of longitude still refused to give him any prize for his not good enough designs. The reason? Harrison was frozen out of the prize because he was not a member of the exclusive trade guild called the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers. He was basically a basement amateur, and the professional elite clockmakers of the Board of Longitude didn't like being shown up. Ultimately, King George III and the British Parliament both threatened to intervene on Harrison's behalf. Unfortunately, before the prize money could be disbursed, and just before Captain Cook returned to England with word of the accuracy of the final prototype, John Harrison passed away. He never knew the degree to which he had revolutionized both timekeeping and navigation. And he never received a payout for his 20 years of painstaking invention and incremental improvements. And on that sad note, our story ends. We hope you've enjoyed this long trek through the history of exploration, seafaring, navigation, and timekeeping. We know it went on a little long, but it's too good a story to cut short. Forgive us for taking our time with it. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by The Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.